可能我都要開始啦，因為咧我哋今日嘅時間比較緊張嘅。咁我哋、呃、今次呢個第三個嘅誒講座咧，就係、是、其實關於檔案嘅跨文化實踐嘅。Uh, welcome everyone. I saw some、uh, new faces here, and also some people、uh, may、uh, they have attend our、um, Uh, seminar yesterday night and also this morning. And、um, this session will be our third、uh, thematic seminar on Asian intellectual digital archives. And I have to say, we have a re really great honor to have、um, Elvin, Dr. Elvin Lee, with us. And also, I also introduce our、um, Our new friends, <laughs> David Smith, David, and I. I, I met him a、uh, few, I think,、uh, last few weeks ago. And uh, and actually, uh,、um, of course, uh, IETC and also the Asia Arts Archives, we have a, a, a collaboration before. But by that time, I didn't.、Um, Came across to to meet、um, David, but it's a really good chance to、uh, for us to have a meeting,、uh, especially for this particular seminar. And David is a head of collections and digital experience in、uh, for the、um, Asian Art Archive. And I think maybe some of our participants already know about this.、Um, Archives in Hong Kong, and I think later on, uh, David, uh, he's what、uh, our moderator and also our respondents, but he will also introduce、uh, Asian archives to us、uh, as a Hong Kong's uh, uh, aspects of how we、um, archiving arts. But uh, uh, the Asian, well, of course, Asian art archives is、um, not.、Uh, Focus maybe、uh, focus more on arts,、uh, visual arts, and performance arts、uh, aspects. So you will going to know more、um, about this、um, archive in in Hong Kong. And、um, Dr. Elvin Lim is a performance, religious, and theater researcher, and he's now an assistant professor in the Department of English Language and Literature at the National University of Singapore. And of course,、um, in particular, he's also in charge of very interesting.、Um, Online archives, and I came across one of the paper written by Elvin in the book. So that's why it's also our honor as well to have Elvin with us this afternoon. So I offer to you, Elvin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, today I will I will not speak Chinese, so I'm very sorry. If you think my English is too fast, you can let me stop. Please wait for me to finish. I will explain further. Otherwise, 啊，当我在问答的时候，我也是可以把普通话回复。啊、uh, ，So I'm gonna switch code switch to English now. 啊、uh, ，But you will find this as something that is、uh, quite pertinent, quite relevant to what I'm gonna talk about, which is the idea of translation and code switching. 啊、uh, ，So I'm very very honored that I'm very grateful that Bernice has、uh, invited me. Thank you so much for inviting me to Hong Kong at this very special moment in the history. Uh, so you have my full support. That's all I can say. Uh, so, um, but um, but why I think it's important to me to be here is because、um, performance archiving and digital humanities is something relatively new in the Asian context.、Uh, so a lot of things I learned from a lot of techniques, a lot of my experience.、Uh, it's a lot of trial and error. We made a lot of mistakes. We we spent a lot of money, <laughs>、uh, government and money. Uh, and so、uh, I hope I can share the mistakes that we make, so that you might also learn from from them. I'm also here to learn from you because、uh, I think Singapore and Hong Kong share quite similar shared of history from、uh, being a colonial state once、uh, currently. But、uh, but why I think my most interesting for me in my case is to is the fact that、uh, you all code switch a lot in, in Singapore as well, like.、Uh, Science will be translated into three or four languages.、Mm -hmm. Here, I find quite similar things. As I'm talking to Bernice and her team, <laughs> we are switching languages <laughs> all the time. So、uh, that is something I want to talk about in my talk.、Uh, it will be a bit conceptual, but at the same time, I'll tell a bit of stories as well. So bear with me.、Uh, I also would toggle between、uh, the slides as well as on the、uh, go to website. So if the video doesn't look quite well, that's fine. Okay, technology always fails. <laughs> Okay, very important thing you need to know. Okay, technology fails.、Um, okay, so、uh, I've been involved in performance archiving for close to ten years.、Uh, 
Uh, this was at a time where um, no one even knew what performance archiving was, uh, at least in, in Singapore. So uh, we had to really start from scratch. Uh, so I didn't know what a database was, I didn't know what software was involved. I don't even know if uh, if we approach a data company, they would even have uh, their own collection. So that was really very tough for us in the beginning. Uh, what I'm grateful for is the fact that then we managed to get a team of international collaborators who are familiar with their own theatre scene, uh, and so we could approach them and, and talk to them. Uh, they themselves would help us negotiate and um, uh, speak to. I was sharing a story with Bernice yesterday. Uh, what we, how we negotiate in Singapore is very different from how people negotiate in uh, um, our collaborator in Japan negotiate. So what you have to do at night, uh, after like uh, like on, on like on a dark night, for example, uh, they would invite the director and have sake or have sushi, uh, talk about oh, how you feel about the data scene, and then at the end of the whole kind of two hour, three hour long, it might be the whole night, uh, finally I asked them, do you think you can contribute to this archive? <laughs> so uh, maybe in the Asian context this might be more relevant to you, which is the fact that you need to establish some sort of trust and relationship with the practitioners and like, before you really kind of go into the policy level or like the kind of formal uh, level. And that we are also involved. We also have to negotiate with legal counsel, we have to talk to our university, or the copyright permissions. But I'm just suggesting that there's also another kind of other side to it, the softer side to, to this um, to the to the aspect of um, negotiating with uh, the companies. So I also acted as the middle person uh, uh, between our project team and the data companies. So uh, and also with the technical and design company. So what I do is uh, with data companies after we sign the copyright agreement, uh, the scripts they will send us the scripts, uh, a production script. Um, if I'm lucky, I get a complete script. If I'm not lucky, I get like sort of uh, sometimes it's even handwritten. Uh, and then, or oh, it's just like a paper, they don't even have to keep it as a file, so I have to scan the production copy, uh, use if you have an OCR software, software that helps convert PDFs uh, into a uh, Word document. So you kind of, by then I kind of learned a lot of those kind of software that I need. Uh, so I, I take those scripts, I translate those scripts, uh, and then, uh, not I translate, but I would hire a translator or uh, editor to kind of work on the script. So when the, when the scripts are all ready, I convert the scripts into uh, subtitles or, or the text that you see later on. I'll show you the video and I'll show you uh, what is actually a very small section, but actually takes months and months of work in order to arrive at a, a, a copy that is uh, reasonably uh, well formatted as well as uh, we try to. Uh, if you still find mistakes on the website, uh, I apologize, but I, I doubt there are because we're very careful in the ways in which we, we, we make sure that the translation is up to a certain standard. Uh, but my particular job is to, in the past, I don't longer do that because I already passed my job to, to my students, uh, which is to when I go to their company and they pass to us. Uh, in the past, maybe not, not so much now, but what, in the past, what I had to do is actually they would give us VHF tapes. I think Daria had some photos in the back of the VHS tapes. Some of them are DV tapes. I don't think anyone uses DV tapes anymore. It's a small tape that you use to video camera. Now, no, it's, everything is all digital now, so it's much easier now. In the past, I have to take those tapes. I have to go to a kind of post-production company to convert those tapes into digital formats. Uh, so that was kind of tedious work that's involved. Uh, I think Hong Kong would also have a kind of well established post production. Yes. Yeah, for you have to do that. Um, and, but one very big mistake I need to point out when we did was to actually convert those tapes uh, into Flash. Oh. Those who work with software will know what's that problem because Flash is obsolete now. Uh, so, Flash at that time was the most, oh. most wonderful thing in the world. Right? <laughs> the websites were so beautiful, so dynamic, so interactive. But one day, uh, Adobe decided that we no longer support mm -hmm. Flash, right? And then that really changed our uh, hope. Then I have to apply for new funding, uh, convert everything we have uh, on our website into HTML5. So bear that in mind, okay? So what technology that is best now might not be 
Uh, so I think there was a question earlier about yeah. the sustainability of, of archives. You need to kind of factor in the fact that uh, uh, the latest technology now might not be the latest ten years later, and everything you do might become sort of uh, wasted. Okay? So there's something to bear in mind when you build you archives. But it's from this understanding of technology that I would like to approach the question of performance archiving. So I will speak from my experience as an archivist, uh, but also as as uh, friends with the other practitioners, <laughs> okay? Uh, because what I really want to try to emphasize in my talk is the, 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 the importance of collaboration, of collaborative practice. So I understand archiving as collaborative practice. Okay, so since the first edition, so I was working on, a, on a one archive first, but it since evolved into this bigger project called uh, Asian Intercultural Digital Archives. So it, it consists of uh, other sister archives. So we learn from the first archive and we use the same methodology or the same uh, concepts behind it to build similar archives. Um, so uh, just to give you some example of some of the sister archives. Uh, so this is ASIA, this is the very first archive that we built. Uh, we went on to, um, we got a new, a, a new colleague, a new partner, joined the department and he, uh, his main uh, field of research is uh, contemporary wayang, so Indonesian puppetry. Uh, so he, he he knows all the friends, all the puppet masters in Indonesia, uh, especially in, in Java. Uh, and so he managed to uh, establish a relationship with those masters, uh, and they very freely give uh, their recordings to them. Uh, but in some cases, there is no recording. So because you have to go to a village, right, and meet this star, <laughs> this puppet master. Uh, what he had to do was then um, commission, he would bring along his video camera uh, and ask the, the puppet master to perform on the spot or like kind of set it up so that there will be an evening performance, that's the one-off performance, so that the camera can capture the performance. And that footage then becomes part of the, this archive. Uh, we're working on a, a new uh, Archive called Theatre Makers Asia. Uh, it will focus largely on physical theatre in Asia. Uh, so we might actually invite uh, 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 to, to contribute to that. Right. Uh, but also other sort of uh, physical forms like Puto. So we will focus more on that aspect of performance making. Which actually is a very good thing because they have to, don't have to deal with the scripts <laughs> <laughs> and just focus on just the video. Right? Okay. Um, so our main goal really is to provide access to intercultural. Uh, so can go back to the slides. Um, is to really kind of uh, focus on providing access to intercultural performances uh, in this region. Uh, it takes a while. To Technology fields. <laughs> okay, uh, and through this practice of archiving, we hope that the archive performances, uh, so our, our main idea is to kind of not isolate, don't think of just national theatres, but to kind of connect or kind of think of it as more of a transnational or trans regional sort of network that is going on. Because what I realized uh, in my experience and my research, I realized that actually practitioners in this region, they communicate a lot and there's a lot of networks going on. So it's actually worth thinking about not just, let's say, have a Singapore data archive, but instead to think about the region as a whole. Um, so to sum it up, um, the overall project, IDA project, as in short, what we call it, uh, we seek to collect and preserve intercultural theater in the region. Because we see intercultural theater as something important because uh, it's, intercultural often theater involves a lot of kind of dialogue between different practitioners. So like, uh, our most famous director in Singapore would be, I think, Wong Kim Sen, who does a lot of uh, Wong Kim Sen, which has kind of like invites different artists from the region to come together and collaborate. Uh, so that's one of the things that we focus on. Uh, we also provide a resource for academic research on Asian performance. So it doesn't mean that you work on intercultural, you don't work on intercultural data, you cannot come to our website because you can also approach it from the angle of translation, translation studies, or uh, on the level of cultural studies, to see how uh, different cultures uh, contribute to this discourse on performance making and cultural heritage. 
Um, and beyond that, we also engage with different user communities as part of what I call the post event of the live performance. So what that means is to kind of think of, okay, to use various verb terms, what is the reuse? How do you reuse those materials? Uh, so that it's not just about you know, going to the theater and watch a show and then write a critic, uh, criticism about it, but instead to think of how, uh, as a researcher, what sort of different angles can we, sort of different angles or different research topics that we can generate out of um, uh, a single production. But once we have several productions put together, you can then see how you can start to do comparison between productions. So what is the kind of overall trend in the region? Are there sort of shared histories between uh, different theater scenes in the region, right? Uh, so just to really emphasize this is that the only way we could, after 10 years, build to archives, uh, and hopefully more, uh, it is only possible because we uh, produce our archives through collaborative practice. I myself, I'm not a, a, tech, a, design, a software designer. So every kind of knowledge I have about software, uh, MySQL database, uh, data farming, I all have to learn from uh, a person who works with like computer science or computer engineer, software engineer. Uh, so we have this whole community of people. After 10 years, we have built this network of uh, trusted uh, translator. We know if you go to this translator, he will produce, he or she will produce a very good script uh, translation. Uh, and we have different nationalities, different ages. So like if we need a kind of, uh, like for example, if we have a, a, a a Cantonese production, we know we definitely have to come to Hong Kong and to look for someone local who understands the nuances of the language and translate them into English for us. But it's impossible, right? Uh, we learned this from mistake because although oh, there's a translation company in Singapore that is quite established, let's go to them. No, they are more familiar with legal documents, translation of legal documents. So even when you select translators, you need to, it's, it's yeah, it's, if you need to find someone who is able to understand performance, who understands that you know there are certain choices that you make uh, that reflects more of the performance than to treat it as a literary text or a text to be, to be read. So it's not just to be read; it has to the text, the translated script must form a relationship with the, the video itself. I'll talk a bit more more concretely what that means when I show you the video. Okay. Um, so currently. Um, this is ASIA, so if you want, you can take out the link there. Uh, just a quick show of hands, anyone has visited the website before? Okay, good. So, okay, if not, I'll show you, I'll give you a brief tour later on, okay? So don't worry about that. Uh, so it has four, um, in fact, I'll just do it now, okay? I'll just quickly go to the website. Okay, uh, the first thing you'll notice is that, okay, there are little, small little buttons here with language book. Okay. Uh, it allows you to kind of toggle and switch between languages. So, um, depending on what language you choose, the entire website will be, uh, you're able to switch to the, to the language that you can read. Um, uh, not just that, oh, we also have, okay, I don't think anybody reads Korean here, so I'll go back to it. Uh, what we also have is uh, a full set of, um, we have our own sort of database structure. This was before we had standards. So uh, so uh, 10 years ago, I don't think there was, there were standards within in libraries. So library catalogs have a sort of standards that you, when you kind of create inventories of collection, there's standards. But in performance, there wasn't 10 years ago. So we started out, we designed our own database structure. Uh, and hopefully tomorrow, when I do my workshop, I can get you to do a bit of that database structuring, okay? Uh, but we have a sort of full, each production has a full set of uh, data based on, uh, the most obvious one would be the production because that's where we don't need to do much sort of uh, conceptualization because it's really just about um, asking the data company, like, when was this production month? Uh, how long was the run? Who was the main cast? Or we can just get the information from their program. So then we just sort of transfer that information onto the database. Right. Uh, 
So this is on the interface level. There's a whole back end where we use Excel worksheets. We have, I have tons of worksheets that, that show like how we, we create this whole inventory of the collection. Uh, okay. Um, but this is actually more sophisticated here because we are also interested in art forms. We are also interested in the cultural negotiation between art forms. So let's say Shakespeare being, you know, yes, it's English text. Uh, how do then a specific culture adapt Shakespeare into their local uh, traditions, for example? So then we, we think about how the kind of distinctive staging strategies that are involved in terms of costume design in terms of stage design um, and also in terms of objects, props. Uh, for me, what is most interesting uh, as a, because I also work like, in culture studies, what I think it's very useful to also think about the sort of points of reference, um, uh, the cultural references of each production. Is it a topical sort of, uh, was it addressing a topical issue or was it addressing a historical issue? Uh, just to address someone's point in the previous, um, I think you were as, as the other critics, so it's very important also to kind of uh, document the sort of discourse or the sort of uh, criticism that happened at the time is to also generate a sort of uh, reception uh, information here. So we, we also separate into artist evaluation, we have academic, we also have others. So others would be things like blogs. Uh, or personal reflection. Anything you can find online, we try to put it there. Okay, uh, even if it's a bad sort of <laughs> um, review of the production. Um, but uh, what we at least have is at least have a sort of list of um, what we call reception entries. Okay. I'm sure you can go to the website and study this in detail yourself. Okay. Um, what else should I show you? Um, we have a production page. This is like the most. This is usually when people come to our website, they immediately go to the production page. They don't go to the metadata because this is where we list out all the productions we have uh, in our collection. Uh, but each production would have something like more details, uh, like kind of standard information that you need. Some images. Uh, sometimes okay, this is not a good example. Um, sometimes we also have, uh, oops. Uh, we also have scanned uh, the PDFs and of the progress. Uh, if we have interviews, we also have interviews. Uh, there's a reason why I show you this first because this is where we learn like the first lesson of acquisition, which is if uh, uh, a production company or a media company owns the copyright uh, to a production, don't go to them. This costs us a bomb to to purchase the copyright. So what we realized, it got more sad. We we decided that it, the the best way to kind of um, explain to a data professional why archiving is important to it is actually to kind of explain the educational and the research um, sort of the benefits to that sort of uh, to think of their work as a kind of afterlife. Of course like 50 years from now you still want your work to be studied. What where else to better sort of assess that information which is through an archive. So uh, when we explained that to them they were actually very nice and they give some of them even donated at no cost at all. Okay, but it only works if you are working within a, an edu uh, educational body. Okay. But I'm not sure about the Hong Kong situation where the practitioners will be so nice. But to, in my experience, and also speaking to practitioners myself, they're very willing to give this for free, the most of the time. Okay, so we aim for like free copyrights, hopefully. But obviously, you need to kind of work with your legal team to sort of establish how you should draw up the, draw up the, the legal form. Uh, to give consent for, so to say very, very clearly that this is for education, not this is for research. Okay. But it's better than them just keeping it on their shelves, right? At least there's a sort of uh, access to those materials. So which leads me to kind of think about the, the big, like for me, the big question, like why archive 
formulas. So when we when we think of archiving of uh, or the archive, uh, what do we think of? Um, perhaps some of you are just kind of guessing here, imagining that we think of it as, an, as, as keeping a record, a document, an act of preserving a past. Uh, we may think of folders and files of old documents, uh, even floppy disks, and we talked about floppy disks yesterday. Uh, we think of our rare books or old items kept in shelves and boxes. Uh, but actually what I want to introduce to you is a sort of relatively, um, it's actually a very old concept, but I'm trying to refresh this old concept, which is to think of, um, think of the word, the meaning of the, well, the root word of archive and archiving. It actually comes from the Latin word archivum, which suggests the meaning of archiving to be an act of recording or preserving. But actually what I'm more interested in is another root word from the Greek, which is um, uh, the arche. Which, which means uh, the beginning, the origin, the first place. And I'm very interested in this word, first place. Uh, because for me, actually, what it means is to provide of the first place, the first instance where you actually encounter the past. So you like think of yourself, think of yourself as sort of a gatekeeper, like a, the first instance where you present. So if someone, the general public, is not able to kind of watch production like uh, 50 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, at least there's a first part of call for this person, and that place is usually the archive. You go, that's the first place you would tend to in order to kind of find information of the past. Uh, but also to think of then how it can expand the possibilities of engagement. Uh, so to use back the word again, how to reuse the archive. That's also the first place where you generate new uses of the, new usage of the, of the archive. Uh, and, but I guess you can say, think of it as, the prob as, as a problem, but also can think of it as possibilities, which is the fact that cultural content is becoming increasingly digitalized, right? And so it re results in sort of existing and also new challenges uh, to archiving dance and performance. Live and embodied performances may be recorded on film uh, or, or video, but each recording, this is a very important kind of thing you need to know, which is a recording is only just one single copy, uh, one single version of a corpus, of a repertoire, of a, la a larger production, right? You're not going to film, like, if there are like seven shows, you're not going to film seven shows. It's a luxury to film every show and then edit everything together into one piece. That's not possible. Uh, it costs too much, right? Uh, so in other words, when you watch a video recording, the first thing you recognize, at least from, the, from an archivist's point of view, is that um, it only captures one. And the camera always already frames. Uh, so if you go to the data company, that's the only copy you have, right? The camera points that way. There's nothing you can change about it. So what? The, what's the best thing? Best thing you can do with it is to to work with it, and work within those limitations. Right? Uh, but that's not to say then, okay, just leave it as it is. There's actually ways in which through the digital technology to kind of. Uh, create this experience, because what you have to think of it as like creating the first place, the first time that you experience the performance. So that's where we started to think or conceptualize, what is this encounter that you, that you want to design? What is this uh, experience we want uh, this invisible user, this person we don't know on the other side of the terminal, uh, staring and watching this performance? So uh, the, first, the first way we kind of thought of doing this uh, is to work on the scripts. So if if, if, if there's nothing we can do with the video, at least we can work with the production screen. So I'm going to show you very quickly. Uh, I'm going to play a video. Do you have a favorite? <laughs> my favorite. Okay, my favorite is this one. <laughs> okay, I'm going to play in the background and just. I see which one has gained your attention more. <laughs> okay, but uh, so I believe that digital archiving somewhat changes the value we place on the live performance. If anything, a video recording stream online may be more immediate than purchasing a ticket and traveling uh, to watch the performance. So the content is made of a flip of your finger. It's certainly more immediate than, say, me buying a ticket to watch, uh, to travel to Macau and attend the Macau Arts Festival. 
that's it. You must recognize the. Oh, what happened? <laughs> mustn't press anything. Press anything. Uh, that's it. Uh, it is still an, uh, a different sort of experience when you watch a video, right? Uh, a different process for making uh, that long trip to the, the, the theater venue to catch a live performance. So it's still an experience. So the live experience is still that cannot it cannot be replaced by the online medium. Uh, and video can also be very intrusive, distracting even. Because I realize a lot of you are not staring at me anymore <laughs> watching the video. Uh, so the focus to be drawn to the screen than, than the speaking person here. Uh, so on the one hand, we cannot replace the experience of watching a live performance. Uh, as an experience unique to you, whether it's the comfort of the cushion, uh, the acoustic of the theater, uh, the occasional sounds of people coughing, I don't know why when we go to the theater, there's always people coughing. Uh, the sharing of the same space in the, in the venue with the performers uh, and the person who does cough. Uh, and so no single performance is always the same. But the paradox is that uh, performers rehearse in order to kind of reach an almost uh, fixed performance that they can replicate each night. Not so fixed as to like, no, there's no changes, right? But, but that a certain structure is retained so that they reach a certain level of performance on the night of the performance. So I believe then, uh, no single performance is still the same for the performer, and that I believe is still the attraction, the layer of theatre. That's why we still go to the theatre and watch, right? That's why I spent like, hundreds of dollars just to watch Suzuki come to Singapore and watch his live performance, right? Um, so on, but on the other hand, we must uh, acknowledge that, and that, or even come to expect that cultural content, cultural heritage, um, cultural production uh, are mediated and performed through digital media and disseminated to us through our mobile devices. Right? So, so even the contents are snippets, so you remember the, the trailers that you watch before you go to a performance, right? That kind of content already comes to us and that affects our uh, perception uh, of, our, of the performance. It also affects our decision making, right? So, uh, should I buy a ticket to watch a show? Okay, what, what information can I have, right? So I go to a website, okay, I, I see a trailer or I read a sort of review of the performance in a, in a previous country that you toured to, you read a review there, and before you make a decision of buying a ticket. Uh, and as theatre critics, right, um, for example, we become aware of the increasing speed in which there is needed to produce a response after a show, right? Because if you don't do that fast enough, another response will appear, and then you have to react to that response. Uh, or uh, your response will be buried by a new set of responses uh, and that gets lost in this whole big web of So the point here is not to kind of privilege live performance over the digital performance, but to point out that they are uh, essentially different. I think I should stop here. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> uh, but yet they are increasingly intersecting with each other. So like you are holding up your phone to take an image, a copy of this, this talk, the phone is vibrating, right? Maybe you have social media news that you need to attend to. Uh, that's, that's our digital life now, right? Uh, and especially in the modern society like Singapore and Hong Kong, uh, we live digitally now. Uh, and our social cultural behavior is increasingly determined by the attention we give to digital technology. So the simple reason why archiving is important is precisely because, uh, this for me, is that the fact that there are obvious geographical and temporal limitations. Not everybody can afford to travel around the world to watch the latest show, right? So if I cannot travel and watch the show, the next best thing is to watch a recording of it. So I mean, for me, that's the most basic, simple reason why we need to archive performance. Uh, but of course, as I keep mentioning from the start, technology always fails you. Uh, and so we have to kind of um, always be mindful of that. But, but the possibilities that technology gives is also quite uh, exciting sometimes, which is to kind of think of how it, uh, it can overcome certain limitations. So some examples I wanted to show you is um, live streaming. This is like a huge thing now, and at least in the UK, not so much in Asia yet, but Singapore is sort of caught the bug. So at our biggest theater venue, Esplanade, 
how we find national theatre to stream live to our theatres. Right. So that has become increasingly popular. But theatre companies themselves have also kind of embraced this new technology. And so what they do is they stream live. Uh, Complicité is a very famous sort of UK company, the uh, most famous director, uh, usually most famous. There are several directors, associate directors from uh, Complicité, but uh, Simon McBurney is, is one of the first to kind of introduce this concept to his performance. So both his uh, The Encounter uh, and also BRPT has been recently live streamed. Uh, I think they really took off took down the recording, so too bad you can't watch this anymore. Uh, so what happens is then, uh, as a live show is being shown at the Barbican in, in the UK, mm -hmm. uh, they will be live streamed. So I actually caught, uh, not this, I caught the encounter live, sort of live. Obviously there's like a, a lack of like few seconds, it's not, not really live, but at least uh, what's interesting then uh, in that experience is that I got to go to Twitter and I, I hashtag the encounter uh, and I wrote my comments, my like, kind of live commentary of the performance mm -hmm. and then actually other people started to respond and or like or retweet my response so there's sort of life, uh, a different sort of life uh, sort of encounter with the performance right? so but I just want to kind of again point out how technology can be quite frustrating <laughs> uh, which is uh, live, but having said that, live streaming and high definition videos were not uh, an option um, for the my archiving team like ten years ago. Right. So my our objective was really trying to first overcome this and provide access. So I like what I'm suggesting here is don't dream too big yet. <laughs> don't dream for live streaming yet. Uh, get your get your collection up first. Uh, and I think this has been mentioned over and over again. Don't trust your hard disks. Mm -hmm. Don't trust your storages. <laughs> and multiple copies. Mm -hmm. Now because we have club service, okay, uh, it's become easier. But having said that, you never know who, <laughs> when like, there will be a tri uh, treaty between or non-treaty within the States and, and, and mainland China. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly you have no more access to the US servers. <laughs> Right, that, that kind of thing can happen, right? mm -hmm. Let's not discount that. So, one of the biggest problems we have uh, is that once we, uh, we got some productions from mainland China, uh, but they have this thing called the Great Firewall of China, right? Uh, so, we were very fearful that when we streamed through a US server, uh, the productions won't, we, our website won't work in China. Yeah, but thankfully that didn't happen. But that is a kind of practical consideration. Uh, that can really happen. So if you have, if we had sort of be, been very uh, dependent on platforms like Google uh, and Facebook, there might not be any sort of presence in mainland China. And yet we are collecting productions from mainland China. So we still have to account and be responsible to our audiences in mainland China. We can still need to make it accessible to that group of audience. So one thing I really kind of really like this quote a lot and I'm just going to share with you. Uh, and this really kind of, this is my favorite quote on archiving. Um, he wrote a, a book, uh, an article about archiving cultures. Uh, and one of the things I really want to point out here is that, you know, rather than see um, archive as a sort of specific place or like some dark room where you kept records together. Actually what is more useful to think about uh, is, is actually what we dare to leave out when we create this sort of, when we present cultures to the rest of the world, especially through a digital medium. Uh, what we dare to leave out is actually a more crucial question to ask ourselves. So I remember one of you was sharing that you have 200 over tapes of dance performances. So what do we leave out of that 200? Tips. So this is something that you have to think, at least from the concept level, but you have to think of that at the very start, which is, what do we leave out? How do we make a sort of meaningful collection? So we start off by thinking of how we conceptualize the collection. So for ASIA, what we think of, uh, what we really sort of conceptualize is to think about intercultural theaters, think about how different, uh, using Shakespeare as a kind of common ground for uh, kind of connect the different geographical locations and then to kind of connect all them together as one, one whole connection. 
So, but there's something more, something that's more personal that we can talk about how one dare to deep mm -hmm. This is something actually we do every day, right? Uh, at some level, we actually also sort of do our own personal archive. I don't mean it's all except from an artist's point of view, really just from a personal mm -hmm. sort of, uh, from a personal experience of using uh, social media. We actually uh, actively archive and disseminate this uh, personal archive to public place or to a selection of followers, uh, to your friends. So at that level, we really make the decision to leave out certain things, right? Uh, so what filters do we use to beautify the image? Uh, how do we crop the image so that it's nice? Uh, and so before the private archive of mobile devices become public, some form of curation happens here. Uh, we decide what text or font to use. Uh, we decide the platform to design it. Uh, so for, in my case, I use Instagram to show pictures of my yeah. one son <laughs> and, and, and my dog. Uh, so, okay, but that aside, I just hope you can appreciate the fact that uh, it's actually not a dog thing. You don't have to always think of the kind of institution level. Sometimes it, it is worth thinking from that personal point of view. How do you want this material to be meaningful to this user, that, this unknown user? Best way to do it for me is to kind of think from their perspective. How you want to kind of, you, you must understand that their attention is being sort of, uh, you're sharing this attention of this user with other not, like thousands of other things that's going on at the same time, right? So you have to understand that you must make this experience for your user uh, worthwhile. Here I'm gonna kind of shift from the personal to the institutional because I think uh, performance archiving really becomes very complex when you think of uh, from an institutional point of view. In the past, uh, as teachers or as students, we often ask our personal contacts for uh, video recording performances. So when we teach, we need to, there's no archive, right? So in the end, we have to like, ask our friends or practitioners we know, uh, do you have this recording or do you know who has this recording so that we can use it for teaching. So I would, uh, as a student at the time, I would actually borrow uh, VHS tapes, I'll go to the, my uh, school library and then I'll sit at the terminal of two, three hours just to watch uh, a show from the 90s and 80s. And there was those, at that time there was VHS tapes. I don't know why I put those VHS tapes. Uh, but yeah, I was watching VHS tapes of uh, old performances. Uh, then it was VCDs, then it was DVDs. Oh, no, before that was LDs. I thought she still remember this format. <laughs> Uh, and then the DVDs, uh, but now my students can just access all this uh, performance archive when they study uh, Asian performance. So, but uh, there's something precious about the, my memory of that video room in my school library. That for me is still sort of an experience. Uh, and I become very aware, I think that's the reason why I, I sort of became an archivist, because I become very aware that unless there, there is a recording lying around, that's it, we, we have no more record of that intangible heritage. We have no more record of this performance. So when you go to ASIA, for example, not this, <laughs> go to ASIA, for example, uh, one thing you might, you might not notice is that uh, there are no productions from the 90s. <laughs> we actively look for them, but there were no productions from the 90s because there wasn't a time when people thought of recording their productions. We maybe have a few, uh, we have Lin Zhaobao, who's a very famous Chinese director. He has a, we have a 98 uh, production of Hamlet there. So that, uh, I think 98 is, 96, 98, uh, that's like the, the cutoff point. So anything beyond, uh, before that, we don't have uh, recordings. So it actually says a lot about how we are actually, when we begin archiving, the, that's the only kind of material that we have. That's the only sort of resource that we can turn to. Archive. So essentially the issue of availability is, is a very big issue after the start. Uh, that was in 2006. Uh, so in a way I felt like I'm a historian like taking part in, in, in trying to kind of historicize uh, this uh, original theatre history. Uh, uh, and I also felt that as this is especially true for Singapore and Malaysia. We, don't have a tradition or culture of storing things well. Mm. Yeah. 
Uh, so there was actually uh, a dealer company, a very key, famous, important dealer company in Malaysia. So we approached them for like materials for one of the, uh, uh, um, the late Christian J. He's a very famous director uh, from the 80s to the 90s. Uh, we asked for like uh, to archive his his collection. Uh, they told us that a lot of the materials were were lost in a flood. So because they kept all their materials in the storeroom in the basement, so the flood waters sort of, oh, yeah, yeah uh, flooded the basement area, and so uh, obviously the tapes mm -hmm. could not be used or restored uh, fully. Thankfully, there were still uh, some from private collections. That's how we work uh, because we pass the tapes around mm -hmm. <laughs> or we make copies. Uh, so thankfully, you know, some friend has has a copy, <laughs> so we use that instead, right? Um, I hope there are those kind of horror stories for you <laughs> when you start on your work, but but I think these are stories that are worth sort of recalling to see that there are actually practical uh, considerations when you do archive. Um, now in data companies in Singapore, at least in the last uh, four or five years, uh, that the, the situation has changed quite a lot. So they uh, because they take funding from the National Arts Council. So part of uh, what they do is to uh, they set aside a budget to archive or document their mm -hmm. their productions. Mm -hmm. That has uh, that is very useful in the long run because what you want because they have to renew their, their major grant every three years, right? They need to send a report. So as part of the report, what they can do is to kind of create a portfolio. For the past three years, these are the productions that I have. These are the recordings. Uh, these are the scripts. Uh, you can have a look. I'm not sure if the administrators themselves eventually watch all the productions or read the scripts, but at least it's a record that to say that this is what I have done. Uh, this is why I proposed three years ago. I actually as concrete evidence that I've met those uh, requirements or those uh, what I propose, what I promised that I would do. So that's why there's a sort of uh, active uh, act of archiving on the part of data companies. But this has also kind of ramifications. Um, uh, some, some, so I didn't need to, uh, like I think some of the stories you shared, uh, very well is that you have convinced the companies to. So on my part, at least in the Singapore scene, I didn't have to do much convincing because thankfully they started to do their own archivings because there's some sort of initiative in the Arts Council. Um, but that also has sort of ramifications to how one would to keep the archive because I started to realize that the, the, the recordings that they give to us or donated to us, um, they are quite sophisticated. They look almost like film. Because <laughs> that's the thing, because if you suddenly have this budget to pay for archives, you want the film crew to come in. And the production crew usually film performance uh, also, they, they do more film, they do, uh, we have a very kind of strong film industry in Singapore now. Mm. So, the way they capture performance is very film light. So you have close up. But if you are, if you, uh, those that watch theatre performance know what, how problematic that is, right? Because you want the whole experience sometimes. So, so yeah, so we end up having a sort of collection that has like, very sophisticated, very polished, <laughs> film productions. But we believe in it, that's what we have, right? Yeah, so you understand then the, the different sort of types of uh, archive performances. So I raise this because uh, the work of performance archiving actually uh, has shifted from um, thinking of it as a history as event, uh, sorry, history as record. It's no longer just to think of it as a record, it might instead to actually think of it as an event, an event in the present. Uh, where you actually have to think more about how you present and frame this archive so that new viewers or present viewers uh, can enjoy or at least appreciate this uh, this culture, this archive culture content. Uh, and so notions of ownership, representation and copyrights are, are inevitably tested when culture production are now shared on the World Wide Web, uh, but across geographies. And hopefully kept low enough that so we can see the archive many decades on. So the last kind of point I want to kind of use to conclude is to think about how uh, think of archiving as a sort of um, 
as an act of dramaturgical practice, but also you have to kind of put on many hats at the same time. But if you yourself cannot put on the hat, uh, it's fine to actually approach someone else who is not within the performance uh, arts sort of scene. So, for example, uh, some of our smaller projects, uh, we actually ask uh, final year students who are in computer science and software engineering to help us to think alongside, you know, how will you create a database for us? Because now we are working on interoperability, which that, what that means is trying to connect different databases around the region so that there's shared information. So when we retrieve our data from our archive, uh, it can also show data from a different archive. So that's a kind of unified uh, collection. So it's worth then uh, expanding your horizon to kind of look at other fields that they can come in and contribute together. Um, so what I really want to propose is to think of archive also as a sort of a way of theatre making. It's actually, it should actually take on the hallmarks of theatre making. It should also be like theatre, like the fact that you have to think of a name for the archive, uh, you have to think of the ways in which you design the interface, it's almost like trying to create a stage design for this new digital stage for your kind of unseen audience. So there are also that sort of considerations you should have. But I'm not saying this so that it kind of uh, makes it daunting for you that it's something that you can't do by yourself. Um, it's as easy, but not say as easy, but uh, it really depends on the kind of levels that you want to create. Is it whether your personal archives, maybe all you just need to have is to subscribe to WordPress. And because there's things like Vimeo, there's YouTube, uh, but you need to set up some certain settings so that it becomes sort of private or is limited within the WordPress platform. But what is actually more important is to kind of conceptualize what kind of information do you think this unseen audience need in order to appreciate or in order to kind of create this first place of encounter for this audience. So, so to sort of conclude, think of archiving, performance archiving as in itself a form of making of theatre. Okay? Thank you very much. Uh, I wish I had more time to talk about translation, but uh, <laughs> but I think we can use the kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. question and answer. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I think you have your own slide. Was very very uh, very very interesting very broad uh, lots lots of things covered um, so I think there's going to be some very interesting discussions to have afterwards um, I'm just going to talk to you for about 15 minutes and just give you an overview of what Asia Art Archive uh, uh, what we do um, why why it's relevant that we're here having this discussion um, I'll give you some examples of the processes that we follow and then I'll give you some examples of some of the performative collections that we've got So um, Asia Art Archive is a not-for-profit based in Hong Kong, but we also have offices in India and in the US as well. Um, Asia Art Archive was initiated to address the lack of available primary and secondary research material relating to contemporary art in and of Asia. Uh, since our inception in 2000, we've built one of the largest collections of primary and secondary source material relating to this field. Uh, this is available both in our physical library, which is on the corner of Possession Street and Hollywood Road in Hong Kong, and it's also available on our website, which can be accessed around the world for free. Uh, we're a charity, so we are funded through philanthropy and also things like grants, so AEC um, support us for specific projects, and we have about 40 staff. So, um, strategically, the way we build our collections is through um, what we call our content priorities. 
uh, these are kind of overarching areas of interest that have been developed based on our core goals. Uh, these can change over time. Now, what we're really, really interested in is um, looking into the stories and histories that are not so well known in the wider art historical narrative. So, um, making the unseen more visible uh, and kind of raising these kind of discussions. And this is not to really make a point of any kind of deficiency within the wider art historical narrative, but really to kind of enrich it and to have other discussions. So, um, you can see at the moment we're doing with what we're looking at is women in art. Again, we can see there's a gender um, disparity at the moment, so that's what we're looking at. Performance art, artist run spaces, um, exhibition histories, um, complex geographies, art writing, innovation through tradition. And so, to give you an example, we know in part, some parts of Southeast Asia, there's a lot less art infrastructure in terms of museums, galleries, and art schools than you would find in other places in the West or, say, Singapore, for example. And so this really raises the question, what's, what's filling this gap in this, this lack of infrastructure? And so one area that we, we think through, and we kind of raise them through our research process, is that the artists are actually self-organizing. And that can be through two things. So that, that could be through, say, artists from spaces. So for example, we did a project in Vietnam uh, at a place called Salon Natasha, where an artist had basically turned their house into a gallery and a kind of meeting space. And that acted as a uh, kind of a local focal, focal point in that city for, for an art scene, and it, it kind of existed for a very short period of time, but um, yeah, created that scene. The other thing is that without infrastructure, artists can use their bodies um, as the medium. So things like, yeah, that's where things like performance art um, come in. So I will probably, through the rest of my slides, it'll be quite heavily looking at performance art, because that's, that's closest to what we're discussing. So we're also interested in these intersections um, what we call complex geography, so the intersection of, of the art scene across different geographies, and that's in terms of in terms of practice, in terms of how artists travelling, how that impacts the development of styles and, and changing of styles, and also thinking of, of art history beyond specific borders. So, um, so research is how we go about building our archives, uh, and this is different to how a more formal archive would actually develop collections. And there are benefits for us doing this this way. There are also kind of um, some negative parts to it again, which maybe we can discuss later on. But um, so, as, as you were saying before, we know we can't really do this alone. It's a collaborative process. So through the research, we have our uh, content priorities. We have our researchers. They're developing ideas um, and kind of methodologies actually look to how we build these collections. They then go out and look for artists and organizations and, and um, local partners who may have the archives, the evidence of actions that we would want to collect to kind of reflect this content priority. Um, once we do that, we then engage them locally. So the researcher, we, we employ people locally and we go through and we do the appraisal, the arrangement and description and the digitization locally. One thing we don't do is we don't move physical archives out of a geographical location. Um, we also, we don't buy archives as well. Um, so once they've been digitized, they then come back to Hong Kong where we have our collections team and they upload those into our collection management system and they, they enrich them and then we make them available online. So this um, is a just an example of our collection, the collection side of our um, uh, of our website. Again, maybe we can, do, we can do a live kind of thing later on to show you some of the other things. But what I kind of want to show you here was a couple of things. So one, if you look up here, uh, this is what we call the tree structure. In a more formal archive setting, they call it the fonts. And that's a contextual framework that relates all of the different, um, all of the different records that we have. So, so this is the Ray Langerback collection, I'll talk about that a bit later on. And then we have art festivals, interviews, performance art in Singapore, and performance art and other events. And if you click on that, it'll go down to another level, and then it'll have each of the different performance art festivals or different works. And then maybe if you go to another level, you'll then actually get to the actual items. So it gives, it gives each of the records a contextual framework. Um, then you actually have the records, um, again, because of copyright, these are actually only available in Hong Kong. We had to geo 
lock those down because we can't have them being shared over the internet, uh, apart from this one. Um, so that's that's one of the things that we, we just you just can't get around copyright. But it's just just a given. But the other thing that we do is we have the, an information tab here. So this tells you how big the collection actually is, and then also uh, there's actually a place where we can give some descriptive information as well. So um, it's quite a rich search kind of browsing kind of flow. Um, and then we also have relevant content. So this is these are things that are not actually archived, so not records, but things that are related to the to the archive. So this, so that's Ray there. That's the collection the person who donated the collection. That's Ray, uh, and so he came to AA and did a presentation and talked about performance art. So we recorded that, and then that's there as well. This is an article about the um, about these discs. But I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. And this is another performance art collection. So not only is it within the collection, looking at specific items, then there's actually kind of extra contextual material. And so this is actually the kind of things that we collect. Um, so it's a very broad range of material. So here, here is an actual documentation of performance. So this is Journey of a Yellow Man um, by a Singaporean artist called Lee Wen. So that's, that's an actual event documentation video. Lots and lots of photographic documentation, and that can be of events, but that can also be of things like exhibition openings, uh, it can be, um, you know, photographs, any kind of photographic documentation, you know, preparation photographs, all of those kind of things. Um, this is a primary document, so you know, we're looking or we're interested in how artists develop their practice. And so even though Li Wei is primarily known for performance art, uh, he, he created some very, really interesting kind of um, scrapbooks and notebooks where he was, you, you can see he was doing kind of drawings and making notes, and although these are not about performance art, we can kind of look and get some idea about how he's developing his practice. Um, the research process also informs how we collect li our books for the physical library, and we have things like uh, oral history as well. So yeah, so um, actually talking about what they're doing, why they're doing it, the background. And then finally here is, is the latest thing that we've done, um, and this is actually, we're working to actually get the metadata that we create to be used as a research tool uh, itself. So we have all of this information about the UN, um, we have all of the exhibition information, things like that. So here we have basically a world map that you can put in Li Wen and you can, it tells you pretty much everything. These, every single one of these are where he had exhibitions or performances through the world. So what we can do using the metadata is for example say show me all of the exhibitions you have from in Hong Kong between 1980 and 1989 and you'll just get the list. And it's not a comprehensive list, it's just what we have, but it's kind of, it's an indicative um, idea of things. And you can kind of look through and look at the flow, and again, the changes, maybe in exhibitions. Um, and then if you click into one of those, you can then go into the, into the items. A little bit behind. Okay. So the other thing that we do is we activate our collection. So I think one really important thing with archives is it's really, really good to kind of collect them. It's really important to make sure you're collecting the right stuff. Uh, it's really good that you're doing good preservation and <laughs> making sure that they continue to be there. But just doing that isn't really enough. You have to actually go out there and make sure that your audience knows the material is there um, and that they're engaging with it. And so this was a project, uh, this was a VR project that we did a couple of years ago. And if you just look here, this is actually a piece of video embedded in the, in the VR uh, experience. Um, of an artist called Yin Yilin who did a performance work where he moved a wall of cinder blocks, you know, breeze blocks across a road in Guangzhou and slowly it blocked the road. Um, and so what we did is that we, we virtualized that experience. And so we used, um, I think, called a Vive headset. And so we put the user in the, in the kind of position of the performance artist. And again, this kind of raises lots of interesting questions you know, about the role of the artist, uh, the nature of participation in performance art, this whole idea of authenticity in, in recreating something using archives, because again, we'll probably discuss this, and you mentioned it, that no archive is complete. And so you're only ever seeing reflections and snapshots of, of the whole thing. And so just to give you an example, this, the, the original performance work was in Guangzhou in the mid-1990s. 
And so if you look up here, that's very clearly a New York letterbox. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> so they, you know, the, the, the developers used off-the-shelf CGI parts, you know, to build the work. You know, so again, the other thing is, you know, you could get hit by an Audi. You know, that's that's an American bus. So, <laughs> so it's like, well, we're we're kind of recreating it, but we're not. And it, so it's got an interesting questions about how you do that. The other thing I think about this that was quite interesting is that this is probably for a lot of young people the first time they were ever interacting with the whole idea of performance art. So for a lot of people, and again, because we were gamifying it, so there's kind of interesting, uh, interesting area. But again, the other important thing we do is programs. So we do a lot of a lot of programs discussing our collections, discussing what we're thinking about. So this is our Basel last year again on. Doing it again on performance art, that's, that's Lee Wen there doing one of his performances. Um, and so this kind of gives us a good, good chance to actually reach out and reach the public. So we had performance, we actually had performances in the booth, we had talks about it uh, as well. Again, it's quite fun to have, a, have the booth being able to be about a, a, a medium or mode of art. Let me do this in English. <laughs> It's kind of interesting to have a um, to have the booth doing something that's very non-commercial in a very non-commercial environment. So a lot of performance art is is anti-market or not very although market is not very interested in it. So it's quite interesting for us to be able to put that into that space. Cool. So if we look, so this is our geographical coverage of our collections. So we um, you know we kind of say, oh, we collect across the whole of Asia, um, but. As you can see, you know, we've had to collect in very, very specific areas. So you, this so East, Air, East Asia, China, that's probably Hong Kong, it's probably China, it's probably Taiwan, probably Japan, it's probably South Korea. I'm not too sure of that. <laughs> that one place is Macau, I don't know. <laughs> so you, know, you can see that because you can't collect everything, we've had to concentrate on specific things. And so one of our areas of interest for a long time has been the development of contemporary art in, in mainland China from through the 80s and then and the 90s as well. Because we're in Hong Kong, you know, we've collected a lot of Hong Kong material. Um, so we're working at the moment to, you know, to develop more collections in Southeast Asia and South Asia. So we have a Southeast Asia researcher, we have a, a, a team in South Asia as well. But you can see here that um, the Central Asia and West Asia We've actually got more stuff from Aussie and New Zealand than we do in those areas. So that's something that I think we do really need to think about. And again, it's kind of good to visualise these things to actually show you, show you those kind of things. So if we bring this all together, you know, what we can see in terms of, of, our, of our geography, priorities in our collections, our geography, that if we look at performance art, we have a series of related collections. Um, and throughout all of those collections, we can have a geographical spread in China, Singapore, India, Malaysia, Hong Kong. And then we also talk about other Asias. So it's, it's very difficult to talk about the development of any kind of practice, you know, without really thinking about New York, London, Berlin, Sydney, and these kind of places where a lot of artists and curators went to study or, you know, went to spend time. Um, cool, so just talk about two collections pretty quickly. So the first one is the one you see before is the Ray Langenbach collection. Um, it's, it was a joint uh, effort between the International Institute of Social History, and again, it fit into our, uh, our content priority because of performance art, because of the geographical reason. The other thing about this collection was it was really quite, quite broad. Um, so it had a, lots of things from art fairs, had interviews, it had specific documentations of performances, um, but it also had video where Ray was literally just walking around a performance art festival. Um, and you just have the camera low slung and you just walk around. And so it was as much about the scene around the performances as it was about the performances itself. So it gave that kind of context about um, uh, about performance art fairs. Because one of the things that was, has been discussed, we were talking about a while ago, is that a lot of a lot of these performance art kind of festivals were actually for other performance artists. There's very few kind of members of the public going to these things, but there was lots of other performance artists going to these events, and then, then you'd have these kind of intersections and these, you know, what we call a kind of complex geography kind of things going on. So we've also worked quite hard to actually enrich and offset this with other documents. So for example, 
the Ray Collection has a performance called Brother Kane, uh, from which was was from Singapore in it was in the 90s, uh, and it was quite controversial, and it kind of blew up into this big tabloid thing that led to performance art not being funded in Singapore for about 10 years. And so we have the performance, but what we were doing is kind of making sure that we had a lot of the other documentation to actually give context around that, that it, you know, it wasn't this big storm that kind of blew up, and the reasons why it happened. So finally, the other, one other collection that we have that shows these things is the Frog King collection. You know, Hong Kong artist, but he spent some of his early, one of the earliest kind of practitioners of performance uh, in mainland China. So this is him actually doing a performance in Tiananmen Square. I try doing that now. <laughs> so, so that's kind of interesting. But then this is he spent a lot of time in New York in the early 80s as well, which, as you know, New York in that time was a very, very vibrant kind of art scene. Um, and so it's kind of interesting to see how, you know, how his work and how his practice was, was impacted and some of the things he was doing there. Okay, I will wrap up there, but this is us, this is me. Uh, thank you. <laughs> sure. Yep. So again, my first question, which I noted down, uh, can we go right back, right back to the beginning? Um, what was it, or who was it, that had the first conversation of like we should really be documenting documenting Shakespeare in Asia? Okay. <laughs> It's a bit of a long history. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there was a collaboration, that, there was talk about uh, collaborating with MIT, because MIT at the time had the technology to do archiving. Um, so they wanted to collaborate with uh, Asian scholars. Um, uh, at the time, I was just a product, project manager, so I wasn't really involved in that, in that high level of negotiation. But, so I was like the project team manager. So I, I worked with the Hyper Studio, that was the studio in MIT that was uh, working up the technology for like, performance uh, archiving as well as performance database. Um, but MIT only wanted to sort of um, have the archive in English. So that was like our first sort of um, departure from because we realized that because we are archiving Asian performance, uh, performance, we it doesn't make sense to not sort of um, um, think of our own uh, local addresses, but people who are from this region who want to access. This is supposed to be their cultural production. Why? Why is it only done in English, in a language that uh, other monocultural or other kind of places would not be speaking English? Because there's an assumption that English is all the universal language right, on the net, but that's not the case. So if a Japanese company uh, only speaks Japanese, uh, and we only archive and don't even produce a Japanese website for them, there's no sort of like, um, we are not, we're not, we don't gain trust from them if we don't actually offer a sort of platform where there's, there's multilingual, uh, a multilingual platform. So, so I think that also led us to kind of shape our own sort of criteria and how we we select productions. We we want to make sure that if we only select a, a production if we are able to kind of create uh, a multilingual interface. So a production script that comes to us, uh, we want to make sure that then we can test it. Everything. Um, so I think that was roughly the kind of context behind. And so again, without going into financial specifics, but how much of the budget is actually going into doing this translation? Work. I would say almost fifty percent, because because it's each script we translate into fifty. Yeah, because each script we translate into four languages. So if a script comes to us, uh, say in Japanese, we have to translate into English, Mandarin, uh, and Korean. But we're not just translating the scripts; we're translating as well the. Uh, the, the metadata. So if we are create, generating this whole sort of catalog information, collection information about a production, we have to translate a data. Uh, so we have this whole kind of network. So we get a, a Japanese editor who really knows the production very well, who can understand, who can help us kind of fill in our different categories, information within those categories. And that data has to be then translated into uh, three more languages. 
So it's quite tedious. I'm not asking you to do it <laughs> yourself. But because once we are committed to that vision that we have to translate, uh, immediately you cannot have the budget for that. Uh, for to, and, and after translation, there's editorial, and there's also sub editorial. What I mean by sub editorial is uh, we need to get someone, usually a student, to uh, format the script so that it's ready, it's web ready, so to speak. Uh, so there's also time coding involved. Um, so someone who understands the language has to watch the video and then match the text to the video and cut off and create text box. We'll do a bit of that tomorrow if you come from my workshop. Um, so how did you come up? Again, English is obvious. Mandarin, sure. Korean? as opposed to Japanese, for example, or one of the other kind of languages? Because you mentioned you had a collection from, from Java, so... Okay. Yeah, I think that that is really because we are lucky enough to meet people who know the scene. <laughs> uh, like you say, I mean, because you're based in Hong Kong, so it's easier for you to kind of get materials from Hong Kong. So the same thing, same thing works for us. We couldn't go to India because we don't know anyone there. And we were very aware that um, uh, Indian collectors are kind of very, uh, they keep their own collection. <laughs> they don't share collection, which is it's a sort of their own kind of, um, how would I put it? They don't share resources that easily to the rest of Asia, so to speak. This is why we only discover much later. So there's a, and also because they have within, within, within the academic discourse of uh, Indian Shakespeare, that uh, they, they, they really kind of, uh, we don't really want to kind of enter into that, that, that territory because they have a longer history and longer tradition of like, writing about Indian Shakespeare. Uh, so, so we avoided that. And also because once we start on it, it will be endless because that amount, there's I think more Shakespeare productions in India than in say, uh, mainland China, like five times more each year. <laughs> because not only that, because we're thinking about India as a whole. We're all different provinces have in many many languages. So if we if we just have Hindi, for example, actions, then you're saying okay, the other states are not worth documenting, not worth archiving. So we avoided India purposefully because it's just no end to it once you start. So we did a project uh, to create a bibliography of art writing in India, and that was across 13 languages. Um, and it was, again, it's, the website is online if you want to go and have a look at it, and it was, it was a very big piece of work um, based across all the big centers. Um, and then when we did it, the kind, of the kind of academics and people were actually talking about this, kind of saying, well, how does this affect our our, jo our work, our job, we have, do we now have to, do we need, now there's, you have the English, you know, the, the, the contemporary art history in English, and then you have 13 or 12 other contemporary art histories for each of those languages, and then you have how they're all intersecting, and so how does that affect, you know, the academic work if, if, if that suddenly becomes available? Um, so yeah, that's, that's something I think that we, we have looked at, I think we're going to continue to look at that as well, but it's, I should say that we don't, we, we, we only, so our website is only actually in English and in traditional Chinese. Um, we spoke about having it in simplified to actually, you know, so we could try and engage the mainland um, artists, because of course so much of our collections is about um, China, you know, mainland Chinese art. Um, but one of the things we found, um, we have a researcher um, two researchers based in Shanghai, and they came back and said, well, the thing is your web design is totally different to what a mainland Chinese user would actually want. So when we designed it, we were like, oh, we want lots of pictures, yeah, lots of pictures, we want interactives, you know, these kind of things. And the feedback we got back was like, nah, just one big thing full of text. That, that's what you do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. Yeah. I, I didn't have the chance to show you all, but I actually wanted to show you like the difference between, say, uh, have you used Webpad before? It's a kind of amateur writing, you know, if you want to kind of contribute fan fiction, for example. If you go to their website, you see a very clean sort of interface. It compared to this, have you heard of Qi Dian? Uh, it's also the Chinese equivalent to Webpad, which is people can contribute like 
chapter serialized novels, so like you know the martial arts, Jin Yong kind of martial arts. People now go to Qitian to, to contribute and create serialized uh, novels. And if you go to the website, it's a big mess. It's like you can see different panels of text. And those that go to Taobao will also understand how different it is from Amazon. So I think I completely agree with you that a website that you design that is clean and polished might not actually work in mainland China. Uh, in Japan, it's also very different. What they love a lot is like uh, scrolling text, text that run across the screen. Uh, so, and they, they, this actually kind of speaks about their culture more. So there's also a cultural dimension to websites that you have to consider as well. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how you identify the performances and, and choose the right performances and whether um, if whether you're looking at say landmark works or keywords and things like that? Um, I must admit that we started off, most of our collection actually came from uh, our Japanese collaborators because we are, we are more established collaborators there, they are more connected with the, the local scene uh, but the, the main kind of criteria is that it must have some sort of, uh, sort of distinctive or creative strategy that, that allows them to adapt Shakespeare. Um, and we also try to look at some sort of, of historical development. How do we get to this point where you get something on stage that is not quite known, not quite kabuki, but uh, uh, uses a no stage, but the acting is very kabuki, but sometimes it's also very naturalistic. Uh, so we look for interesting productions like that, that sort of, like, it's so fused, to get so intercultural that, you know, then, then that's where we come in and sort of kind of dissect for the, for the viewer and try to explain how do those different art forms come together in a, in a, in a single staging. So these are the kind of productions we look for. But again, there are a lot of practical considerations here, which is, whether it's available. So we only very much later have a lot more Korean productions because we, we got a collaborator to join us and he basically know every famous director in, in Korea. And so that's how we establish a network with Korean directors. Have you looked, for example, at, I guess, fringe theatre, kind of avant-garde theatre? And, and so these, these look like quite you're very well staged, mm -hmm. you know, productions. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, have you have you looked at the kind of I guess the the avant garde or the fringe kind of part and whether they they're doing it? Or? Not not yet because uh, but then then because once we we manage to kind of like make sure we have one production for one key director, then we realize that's where we realize okay that's only showing just one aspect of theater making in, in say Korea, so then uh, we had our collaborators approach uh, a, a youth theater company uh, so. It's, um, a company that is not, that don't mount their productions in like the big theaters, instead they do in like warehouses. So we, we are aware of that problem. It's just that, again, it's dependent on collaborator. Uh, if he has no contact with a specific company, then we, it's impossible for us to come. But eventually, uh, what we sometimes have to do is we personally have to travel to, uh, so, for example, Taiwan, after we managed to get Wu Xing Kuo, you heard Wu Xing Kuo, yes. Uh, we uh, managed to get, get assignment theater, ta, ta ju, uh, I'm not sure if you know ta, assignment theater, <laughs> the Taiwanese characters might know. Uh, they are kind of sort of avant garde, they kind of do street performances. Mm -hmm. So I think I think as you build out your connection, then you are aware of where your gaps are, and then that's where you eventually try to address them. That's why we don't, so if uh, a famous director gives us Ambitions to five productions, not all five will go up. But we, we are committed to at least putting up one. Uh, but then we have to then um, also include a production that is not quite mainstream as well. So, again, one quick question about the website that I saw. Last question. <laughs> <laughs> Is uh, you, had, you had the interactive, so the. Um, sorry, I'm trying to see one. So is that the pie jump? Oh, oh no, here we go. So, is this is this the only way that um, that researchers can look at, at your metadata, or is there a more kind of formal way? Because this is one of the things that we have struggled with a lot: is that we really want to do this, and we we've tried to do this, 
And then we've got kind of other researchers who are like, I'm used to going to a physical archive where you have a card in there. I just want the metadata, you know, set out in a nice straight, you know, nice straight lines, you know. So this is this is too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm very aware of this uh, as well. Uh, yeah, it, it, I think this this inherited from our you know when we got very excited by Flash, so we designed because Flash used to be you know it's very popular to use this kind of like uh, design for Flash. So we can't inherit that, but we realized that's a problem. So instead, what we did, um, we developing this. Uh, what? Okay, there's this small little icon here. I don't know if you can see it. If you press this, we have a workspace. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay. So if you press this, it will go to your. Um, it will generate this sort of. Uh, so that it's still possible to do that. <laughs> Just that, okay, it's still a bit tedious because you still have to open each bubble and then copy the text. But we are aware of that problem uh, because the more we talk to like people who use our website and they tell us their needs, uh, let's try to address them. But um, there's only so much we can do now. If our budget runs up, uh, we have no tech budget, then that's the technology we have for now. So we'll wait for the next kind of uh, run application to kind of factor in our technical needs. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. So you have to think of your design alongside your technology as well as like your user needs. So it's not that straightforward. Cool. Uh, any questions from the audience? Yes. <laughs> talk about technology and uh, financial. So it's uh, obviously it's burning money. I for archive. So um, so since your two are having a uh, long history for. One is for ten years. You, I, I believe, AAA is almost twenty years. Twenty years. Yes. So, but back to the beginning. So, uh, what kind of like a technology, like a software, or any practical tools that you uh, will recommend it to some beginners for very limited financial support? <laughs> so, and another question is, um, at the beginning. So, which where the the domain name that you will recommend it to register in Hong Kong or in mainland China or in Singapore. Thank oh, okay. you. Okay. Uh, for domain name, we use GoDaddy. GoDaddy. G O D A D D Y dot com. Yeah. Uh, it's like very cheap, right? Three dollars, three dollars for a year. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. In the past, it was really very difficult. We 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 explored the option of uh, because we are from National University of Singapore, so we asked the community center if they can spare some server space for us. But it was there's. There's not so much institutional sort of uh, red tape that we we avoided that option because then it's saying that the the con the connection that we have belongs entirely to um, uh, NUS. So actually, for, for us, it's actually more it's more more considering finding a neutral place where you have a, a server and you rent that server. But then recently we had a new problem, which is uh, our grants don't allow us to. Um, pay for something uh, in advance. So let's say if you need to rent a server for 10 years, uh, our run is only for 3 years and we can't pay for the rest of 7 years. So uh, one of the kind of options that they recommend is to buy your own server. So it's like you buy your own little hard disk that is connected to the cloud service and you pay for the cloud service. Uh, and so then there's a sort of, like you in a way still own your own server. I'm not sure that I'm not a technical person, but but it's worth uh, exploring that option which to have your own server, to buy a, a server, uh, and just get someone to start. But that can still be be quite expensive. I have to check. I'm sorry. I have to check. I don't remember the speakers because I don't pay for them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, but if you pay for like a company called uh, Media Temple, 
but it's a US, US company, I'm not sure how sensitive that would be in the future. Uh, but uh, roughly that is about um, uh, 200 USD a month to have, say, um, 6 terabytes worth of space. 6 terabytes. That's quite a lot. For, yeah, 6 terabytes is quite a lot. TB. Yeah. yeah, that's quite a lot for a performance archive. Uh, but from the beginning, you kind of set when you convert your videos, don't go for a high definition. Oh. Depends. I mean, I'm not sure. Maybe that might change <laughs> in the future. But like one two hour long production is usually about uh, 800 megabytes. Um, so factor that in, and then as you count like how many space you need, then or how many how how how, how, many, how many productions you expect to collect, then work that through uh, in your budget. Yeah. So I guess, so going, going back, you are talking about um, how you manage collections. So there are two open source collection management systems out there. One's called Omika, I think. Uh, and the other one's called Collective Access. Uh, and I think, I believe, you can either download those and create your own uh, local version, or you can actually pay them to have an instance. And so basically that, that is your back end where you can manage all of your photos and documents and uh, videos and things. And it also gives you a front end website with the shelf as well. This is free. It's open source. Yeah, open yeah. source. But if you, if you don't pay them, it, it's, it's, it's free and it's not free. <laughs> it's, the software is free, but you would need to pay a developer to actually configure it and actually get it set up. Or you pay them and just use one of their versions. They, they, they'll give you a set up version. So that's that's the back end. That will give you a website as well. You'll need a developer to make that, you know, to, to, to brand that so it looks like what you want it to look like. But those are two um, those are the two kind of open source versions. With video, I would actually suggest um, store your videos in um, in the collection management system. But I would actually offset the costs uh, and just stick them on YouTube and just link them to your website. So keep the copy. So keep the master copy, so whatever comes out of your video editor or your camera, keep those. Upload the edited version to YouTube and then just link to YouTube. Mm -hmm. The problem with video is the file size is really, really big. So if you have it on your server, you actually have to have it on a very fast server to stream the video to the user quick enough for it to actually be a pleasant experience. Mm -hmm. The one criticism we get, well, one of the biggest criticisms we get is that our videos stutter because we have them in, on the cloud server. If someone watches it, it has to move it across to a fast server. Because of course, fast servers are a lot more expensive. So I would just, if you have lots of video, just use YouTube, get Google to pay for it. Um, and just you just manage your master copy offline. So when technology advances, you've still got the master copy to make another version available. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in terms of software, I think MP4 right now is the best format to convert into usually H264. I'm not sure why I'm saying I'm technical. Say how technical you? Yeah, yeah, but you have to learn on the on, on, yeah. as you're building. You kind of have to learn all this kind of text yes. because that's how the language that you have to speak when you let's say you engage a tech company or you're doing it yourself. That's the kind of language that you need to learn uh, in order to create your videos. Uh, one thing I'll add though is that if your audience is in mainland China, um, I'm not sure if YouTube can. Yeah, that, is yeah. that is true, that is true. Yeah, it is general. Yeah, but then if you don't care about mainland China, then, <laughs> then you have to probably use YouTube. <laughs> right, other questions? Because I think we're. One more? Okay. So I, I have a question actually for, for Elman. Uh, I'm just curious. Uh, you said that do you have do you need to sign any contracts with the um, companies because are they giving the copyright to the consent of ha uh, letting you have this video online for a period of time or um, how do you guarantee that or, or you explain to them maybe uh, I, of course I'm, I'm looking forward to have your you know the, the, the system will be online forever but you never know what what will um, be going. So how would you explain this, um, uh, the duration of, of you oh, keeping this? We, we don't even mention the duration. We just say as long, <laughs> yeah, as long, as long as it's used for um, education and research, uh, we use it indefinitely. Oh, okay. 
Yeah. And, and they all accepted it. Yes. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> yeah, I think because, mm, maybe because my own opinion, my own sense of this is that uh, we are sort of a, Singapore is always like counted as this like, service center, it's a very kind of neutral place where, you know, uh, we kind of say that anywhere is sort of like a global institution, we, we are like actually just performing this service provider <laughs> where your, uh, we will take care of your collection and make sure it's translated. But in return, I think what we also promise to uh, our uh, donators as well as our data companies uh, is that we give the translation to them, we translate it. So if they want to use it for their own sort of touring, so it's very kind of beneficial for them because then if they have an English script, oh, then I can tour to Edinburgh, for example, I can tour to, so even if it's a fringe company, uh, uh, they can use it for their tour to, uh, to, to the fringe festivals, for example. So, uh, so you have oh. some, something in return that's always yeah. um, useful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry. Just, yeah, 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 yeah. I would say really, if, if you're going, if you're getting permissions and copyrights from people, uh, future proof yourself as much as possible. So we, when we start, when AA started off, we, because we were working with artists who, you know, didn't really even understand or care about the concept of copyright, but our agreement was basically like, you can let us, we'll let you have it just to be on your website, to be online. But of course, in that time, you know, social media is now just this huge thing. So of course, we need to tweet and put on Facebook collection items which we're not actually clear to do. So then we had to go back and go, give us permission to have it online across our whole of our digital footprint, you know, now and in the future, across all technology, basically. Mm -hmm. And then we've done that. We're now even looking at the next, you know, the next, the next one, just to make sure that it's kind of, it's open, open for people to, to use and things. So that's the other thing is to discuss open licenses. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. talked about Creative Commons and things like that, but if, if, if they're open to it and, you, you know, and you're able to do it, then try and adopt an open licensing framework. And that's just, it's just really clear for users to know what they can do with a piece of content, what they shouldn't do with a piece of content. Um, so that's, that's the other thing that we're really looking at, trying to look at at the moment, because how the users want to interact and use this content changes. And so when we started, people were happy just to look at it on the website. Now with interactive storytelling tools and things like that, they they are more interested in taking the content and embedding it or putting it into a PhD thesis and things like that. So future proof yourself. Well, actually, it's very good and some online. I think Creative Commons might have kind of agreements online that you can download. Yeah, so there, there are some tool, there are some kind of tools and resources out there. Um, the problem is is that yeah every organization is slightly different in, in the requirements that they need. So it's very difficult to have a kind of generic legal document. So you know ours is very specific to our user group. We know our users are academics, um, teachers, and arts professionals, and so we can tailor what we're asking the rights holders, you know, knowing that audience. Um, you know, if you if you think that your audience is the general public, then that that's probably you need a, a lot broader requirements, you know, for that. If it's for school kids, then you, you're going to need to allow them to download them onto their computer and edit them and do stuff for you know, for school projects. So that's yeah, very kind of open license. So yeah, it's very difficult to have kind of one generic legal document. I'll just say that you have to check. For us, we check with the data companies whether it's, we can allow downloads, but that's no no. So so on the technology side, we have to make sure that it's secure and there are no downloads allowed. Right. 
And, and for case, uh, because we you, uh, we finish uh, an oral history project also concerning about the copyrights of the interview is content, and uh, actually we have, I, I must say, may, uh, one of the uh, resources is from our friends of theatre circles. So we are actually collecting some uh, 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 documents from them, and we and we compile uh, one that fits our particular project. And of course, we also um, consult uh, some legal um, advice, and also so we have to make uh, uh, the particular uh, document for your own uh, pro the, the, uh, for that particular project. Actually, yeah, yeah. But still, there's some uh, I think templates or references you can yeah. uh, get it online. You do, do get the physical copy, say that the physical copy will be within the organization. So we do have physical copies. So if you ever come to Singapore, you want to see the reason productions are not mounted on the website yet. So if you want to see them, actually, you can come to a physical library. Uh, so it's still good to have a master copy, so that, like, like what David says, such that if from the master copy, you can sort of like, think of the, uh, its other users as well. And because technology is always changing, you might have different, multiple users of the same master copy. Thank you so much, uh, David, and thank you very much, uh, Alvin. So thank you. Thank you so much. It's a really huge note and an uh, and, uh, uh, interesting bridge to our next session, which will be begin at 4.30, because uh, talking about the online platform, still we need something physical to sign, to sign because the contract actually you cannot be something uh, virtual. So uh, in our next session, we are going to talk about the offline documentation and the online sharing. So how these two uh, platforms or these two uh, areas can actually work better and have more interaction uh, in between. So um, we'll have uh, our next session in 15 minutes.